Beneath a tiny village, a labyrinth of secret tunnels. Oh my goodness. Why were they so important during one of the world's bloodiest battles? This is the biggest single concentration of graffiti on the Somme. What spectacular uses have been found for these Welsh caverns? Amazing, just to think that everything was actually mined here by hand. Carved out by slate miners in the toughest conditions. They are razor sharp. They would cut you in half. And deep beneath a glacier. It's the most volcanically active spot on Earth. What stunning spaces lead to the entrance to Earth's fierce and fiery core? Wow. Beneath our feet lie extraordinary spaces, caves, and tunnels. The span and the size is just crazy. They've been designed and built by us. This is the only one with a castle. As well as formed by nature. But how were they created and adapted? By who and why? You've got to face your fears. Throughout history, subterranean life has captured our imagination. I feel so privileged. We're going further and deeper to unearth the mysteries, the stories, and the secrets of underground worlds. France is the largest country in Western Europe. Its northern region has an exposed landscape of farms and villages. 12 meters below this picturesque village lies a complex of tunnels carved from the soft chalk bedrock. These chambers were to play a key role in one of the bloodiest battles in human history. It's a real privilege to come down and experience this. It's one of those places where time stands still. What unbelievable discoveries have been made in these depths? It's unique. It's a, it's a unique piece of uh, graffiti. How did the tunnels play a crucial role during the First World War? They actually have the toughest job to do. They, they have the toughest job, yes. Yeah. And what can be learned from these thousands of hand-carved messages from the past? He was uh, one of the first black uh, professional footballers. This place is a time capsule. One hundred and sixty kilometers north of Paris, Bouzancourt is a village of around 500 people. The church of Saint-Honoré dominates the surrounding countryside, and within it lies an entrance to a secret world. These tunnels contain mysteries from many different historical eras. Battlefield expert Vic Payak has been researching the clues left behind. The first thing you actually see uh, here is obviously a man-made structure, bricks, but then you enter another world altogether. The villagers of Bouzancourt started digging here in the 15th century. They would have found the porous, chalky terrain easy to excavate by hand because it drains well and requires no shoring up. The tunnels were built for two reasons. They would actually come down here for safety, for security, or to see out a particularly bad winter. Come down below here, because it's the same temperature all year around, it might be absolutely freezing up above, but here it would be actually more hospitable. Construction started relatively shortly after the Hundred Years' War, when there had been lots of battles here, uh, coming backwards and forwards. That was in 1453, when the French finally won a century-long fight with the English for the right to rule their own country. But there would be many more wars in the coming centuries. These tunnels gave the villagers a secret hideaway to take refuge from all the fighting. Incredibly, the entire village would disappear under, underground, bringing with them their cattle, their sheep, their pigs, and they would hunker down here. These were secret places. As far as the enemy were concerned, they'd find a deserted village. The entrances would have been hidden. Armies that passed through this wouldn't have had the slightest idea. The villagers dug out tunnels and 50 separate rooms to provide accommodation. The largest of them covers 30 square meters. The rooms were actually used by individual families in times of crisis. Uh, and there would have been a wooden door here, and then you turn the lock on it, and uh, you know, because it was your property. And you can actually see, although the wood's long gone, you can still actually see the evidence of where the door frame was. This was the environment for the family. They would have actually lived in here and had their uh, bits and pieces here. 
But actually, this was for the cattle. And these were actually the stalls for the pigs, the sheep, whatever beasts they actually had down here. Vic is meeting local historian Jean Le Grouvien, who has traced his own family back through time by analyzing the carvings on the tunnel walls. De mon grand père. Ah, super. Et là, c'est encore un frère à mon grand père aussi. Okay. C'est. That was actually his grandfather and his two great uncles. John Luke comes from a long-standing family. They've been here for centuries. There's a long connection here. The most extraordinary carving can be found at the entrance to one of the underground chambers. Alors, appartient à Jean Rouvilin, 1711. Right. This is the oldest, oldest inscription here in the, uh, in the shelters, 1711. He did his family tree some years ago, and to his absolute amazement and delight, of course, uh, he found the name and the correct time scale. Members of his family, all those generations ago, slept in this cave. It is unique, it's a, it's a unique piece of graffiti that actually directly connects one of the rooms to, to, to a family in the village. In the year 1711, Europe endured one of the coldest winters on record. It's fascinating to see visual evidence of a family taking refuge from the elements. Almost without a shadow of a doubt, the entire family, indeed the entire village, came down into these caves to see out that awful period. Un patrimoine très important pour la commune de Bouzincourt. He said it's a very important place for the community here of Bouzincourt because it's a, it's a place that bears witness. The tunnels played their biggest role in Bouzincourt's history when the tiny village found itself on the front line during World War I. It was a war between two power blocks, one headed by Britain and France, the other by Germany, that lasted from 1914 to 1918. Bouzincourt is close to the site of one of its deadliest battles along the course of the River Somme. French troops are actually in occupation here. The Somme actually was a quiet period until the Battle of the Somme in 1916 when the British arrived. The villagers of Bouzincourt fled, leaving the British army in the town. During the atrocious Battle of the Somme, soldiers fighting in muddy, disease-infested trenches found these secret tunnels, like others before them, as a welcome refuge. So to be 12 meters underground in structures such as this was, was heaven sent for, for the British military. Immediately what you see uh, here is the life that the men actually lived uh, when they were down here. Soldiers did everything down here. It seems that this could actually have been the chapel. There at the back, you, the earthenware jar, is actually used for rum ration. The soldiers actually got a daily tot of rum, and it would have been very welcome to keep out the cold. The Battle of the Somme lasted five months, from July to November 1916. On the first day, more than 19,000 British soldiers were killed by shelling and machine gun fire, the largest loss of life suffered by the British Army in a single day. What you can lose sight of in the Great War is individuals. The tunnels provided those men with shelter and relief from the carnage, as well as an outlet for their graffiti, an expression of their hopes and fears carved into the soft walls. We well, just see the names and the marks they've left in history. These were real people. Seems a bit of a cliche to say, but of course they were real people. These men all mattered to their wives and their loved ones. And you can lose sight of that, but you don't when you're in a place like this, because you can see their names. This is the biggest single concentration of graffiti on the Somme. This is remarkable. A veteran uh, of the Great War said it was 90% sheer boredom, 10% sheer terror. For these men, it could be here today and gone tomorrow. This was a, maybe a final chance to, to leave you mark for, for posterity. There are more than 1,500 signatures and drawings in these tunnels that date from the First World War. Some were carved by American and Canadian soldiers billeted here as part of the Allied force. Huge variety of soldiers here. There's actually uh, two brothers here, side by side here, look. You can see this E.A. Jarrett and S.H.R. Jarrett, Canadians, both in the signal company, yeah, 12th Brigade. Where the soldiers have given their regimental numbers, 
historians have been able to trace their military careers, both during and after the war. Ray Cleansing. This guy was from North Dakota. He was to win two military medals for bravery. So he survived his encounter with the Battle of the Somme. He actually died in 1981. Another carving refers to a particular British regiment. One of its officers was a celebrity at the time. Lovely regimental badge here of the 17th Middlesex. The Die Hards was their nicknames. They were the unit that had a uh, certain Walter Tull. He was a pre-war footballer for Tottenham Hotspur and uh, Northampton Town. He was uh, one of the first black uh, professional footballers um, and certainly the first black British officer. He was actually to die not far from here in 1918. Three million soldiers fought in the Battle of the Somme above these very caves and one million were wounded or killed making it one of the bloodiest battles in human history. During a bombardment, the church of Saint Honoré was destroyed. It was rebuilt in 1920 in the shape of an artillery shell as a tribute to the fallen. Richard Stenning from Southwest England recently discovered that his great-grandfather, Major General William Rycroft, was among the British forces here 113 years ago. It's intriguing to come here and uh, retrace some of his steps. Richard's on his way to meet Vic, to explore the tunnels where his great-grandfather once took shelter. I knew nothing about the underground space at all. It does sound an incredible place. I'm excited to see what's there. Oh, my goodness. Look at all that brickwork. OK, Richard, so we're dropping into the tunnels here at, at, at Boozencourt. Have you ever seen anything like this before? Nothing quite like this, no. It's not built for creature comforts, as you can see. You're stooping. Banging your head would have been pretty commonplace here. How many would have been here? Would they have been packed in? They would have been packed in pretty solidly, yes. Yeah. Uh, they were safe down here. Yeah. And away from the bombardments, which were pretty continuous. And you'd have still felt it. The war made a devastating impression on an entire generation. Present at the Battle of the Somme was a 24-year-old officer in the Lancashire Fusiliers who would later become a phenomenally influential storyteller. There's some anecdotal evidence that uh, Tolkien was actually... I saw here. something yeah. there that he, he served around. Yeah, he certainly served here. That's, that's, yes. that's not open to debate. The famous Lord of the Rings author, J.R.R. Tolkien, undoubtedly drew on his wartime experiences in his epic saga of good versus evil. Underground worlds play a crucial role in the fantasy land he created, named Middle-earth. From the Hobbit's burrows to the mines of Moria and the Dwarven realms. He could very well have been in these, in these tunnels. It would have been very cool had he left his mark here. That and there was something, that would have been something could, yeah. lend some thought to him for Middle Earth. Yeah, right? sure. As a major general, Richard's great-grandfather Bill would have commanded a division of around 18 to 20,000 men. There were 50 British divisions at the Battle of the Somme. What do you know uh, of your great-grandfather? It's only recently, in finding his diaries and things, that I've really looked at his history and realising he was a divisional commander uh -huh. in this important part of the, in the first part of the song and the, probably some of the heaviest fighting. It's certainly bringing it, to, bringing it to life from being just a fact of one's past. Uh -huh. Voyage of discovery to see what he went through. Yes. Unlike later conflicts, during World War I, senior officers still found themselves in mortal danger on the front line. There is a... All right, I've actually never seen a photograph of him, so there you go. Yeah, tremendous. And this is uh, volume three, Confidential Diary, the 32nd division. That's the original, is it? Yeah. Goodness gracious. Yeah. It's very rare to, uh, yeah. to see something like this. William Rycroft's diary of the first day of the battle shows the risks he took with his men, while around them, vast numbers of British and Allied lives were lost. Rode with Lieutenant Colonel de Boussincourt, as we alone were actually to break through the enemy main position on the first day of operations. They actually have the toughest job to do. They have the toughest job, yes. 
Vic has a surprise for Richard. Let's have a look. The name of his great-grandfather is carved into the rock face. Boy. Ah. Ah. There we go. That is it. Gosh. Bill stood here, right? In this spot. The Griffins is always from other ranks and yeah. you know, to actually see. A Major General, general in charge of 20,000 men. It was absolutely stopped me in my tracks. It was fantastic. 32nd Division, 1916. Quite extraordinary, really. It does bring a lump to your throat. Yeah. That's over 100 years, isn't it? It will take a bit to sink in with that, really. Being the officer commanding. You've got these lives of tens of thousands of men as your responsibility. How would I have coped with that? Could I have stood in his position and done that? It makes it all real. Major operations of the Battle of the Somme ended on the 18th of November, 1916. Visiting these caves has brought Richard one step closer to his great-grandfather. It's a real privilege to come down and experience this, to have this opportunity to see where my great-grandfather might have been, um, to tread perhaps where he trod. The wall serve as a lasting memory to Allied soldiers who stood firm in the fight against military aggression. But these caves have offered sanctuary for centuries, and perhaps they will do so for hundreds of years to come. This place is an awful lot more than just my great-grandfather. Think of how many people were down here, the soldiers during the war, for the local inhabitants all through the years. It's one of those places where time stands still. Wales, a country with a land mass of 20,000 square kilometers and a population of three million. It's mostly mountainous, especially in its northwestern region. Beneath these peaks lie a series of mines, carved out over hundreds of years by generations of men and even children. Now a new underground world is making use of the caverns they left behind. This is the Slate capital of the world. What conditions did the workforce endure as they mined this so-called grey gold? What these men went through, the conditions they worked under, they risked their lives every day. And how have the mine workings been transformed by adrenaline junkies? Woo! It's like Victorian times engineering mixed in with modern engineering. The hills around Blaenau Festiniog in Gwynedd County are strewn with rocky waste material, left over from a mining process that defined the local community for centuries. Best known for its use in roofing and flooring, slate was first mined here by the Romans around the year 45 AD. But it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution in the mid-19th century that the demand for this precious rock hit its peak. This mine was opened by a gentleman by the name of John Whitehead Graves. John came here in 1846 with his team of men. They were here for two and a half years and found nothing. Just before the end of the third year in 1849, they struck the old vein of slate and he never looked back. The mine extends one kilometer under the mountainside and contains more than 25 kilometers of tunnels and 250 chambers spread over 16 levels. They're accessed by a narrow gauge railway, the steepest of its kind in the UK. The mine closed down in the early 1970s. Brian Jones once worked in the mine on the maintenance team and is now a guide. This is a perfect example of the way the slate runs. The veins run on a 33 degree angle. 
The world-famous Slate Vein was formed 500 million years ago when this area of Wales was beneath an ancient seabed. A massive volcanic eruption put huge amounts of heat and pressure on the seabed, pushing it up to an angle of 33 degrees and baking it solid in the process. We're down now approximately 400 feet underground. The deeper you go, the better the quality of the slate. It's all to do with more pressure it's had and it's had more volcanic heat. During the slate mining boom of the 1880s, the population of Blaenau Festiniog rose from around 3,400 to more than 11,000. Chechwev was one of several mines in the town, and miners flooded in to work this rich seam. Now this looks to me like good quality slate. Look at the very fine graining in, in the slate itself. Uh, you can see here where there's been a previous miner drilling, and you can see the blackness in here where the, uh, the gunpowder, where the blast has been. By candlelight, men would use basic hand tools called jumpers to work their way into the rock before setting an explosive charge to blow large pieces from its foundations. That's the natural crack in the rock. A rock man would drill in here, maybe down about this, this depth, charge it and blow it out. When he blows this out, then hopefully, more than likely, would, it would break here. And then this nice lump of slate would fall down here. Up to about 1880, 1890, this would have been done by a jumper manually. By the end of the 19th century, at the industry's peak and coinciding with the explosion in Victorian house building, half a million tons of top quality slate was extracted every year. This was enough to produce tiles to cover an estimated 14 million square meters of roof. Local man Phil Jones can trace his family connection with this mine back through three generations. I remember coming here with my father and my mother. My father always used to say, down over there is where he worked with uh, his father, uh, my grandfather in the 70s. Later on in life, I found myself in the same place. It's a privilege to be able to work here where they worked and to uh, pick up on the history of this place because it's a big part of everybody's lives if, they, if you come from Blinefestinjog. Today, Phil works in the mine as a guide retracing his ancestors' footsteps. So yeah, this is where my father and my grandfather worked. My father was my grandfather's apprentice, but rockmen is what they were, and they would be extracting this late. In 1912, drills using compressed air were introduced to replace the primitive hand tools. This is uh, one of the drills in Janvach, they called this uh, small engine. You'd have a pipe for the compressed air on the side, You'd have a drill bit at the bottom, and this is what my father and my grandfather would have used. It weighs about 40 pounds. It's very heavy. Even though modern tools were brought in to help excavate more slate, they continued to use tried and tested materials to suspend themselves high up on the rock face. The reason why they used chains was because um, rope would actually uh, rot in, this condi in these conditions eventually. The men, they had to pay for the material in the early days, and what they would do is they'd fasten the chains to pegs like this with fuse wire, and then they'd light the fuse wire and they could get the chains back. So they looked after their tools. Later on, when the company paid for the tools, they just left these chains in place. The skillful miners would scale the wall on chains. Once the men were in place, the chains would be secured around their legs. So that locks into position and it frees my hands and then I can work on the rock surface. Just move my leg like that and I'm out of a situation fast. Don't think I could do that job. The chambers were intense spaces to work. It could take a group of four people up to 20 years to excavate a chamber this size. There's about 10 chains here. Now, there would have been a man on each of these chains, so this, this rock face would have been quite a busy rock face, and they would have been up there for uh, maybe 10 hours. It was a dangerous place to work. Life expectancy of a miner was just 45 years old. Now, you could be working down in this chamber here, looking up at these dangerous pieces here hanging over your head all day. When these pieces go, they are razor sharp. They would 
cut you in half. In between miners' shifts, workers known as danger men were employed at night to remove unstable rocks, helping to make mining less hazardous. They would have been working on the tops of these ladders. Wrap your leg around the top run, hang on for dear life, crowbar in one hand, lantern in the other, levering and banging away at these pieces here, getting these dangerous pieces down from here, making this place safer for the next day. Now, they weren't paid much for this job, even though they risked their lives every day. A lot of respect from the men and a lot of respect from the, the management for doing this. Richard Roberts began working in the slate mine industry when he was 15 years old. There you go. Oh, it's probably the ideal size of a roofing slate. This is where they made the wages. These men up here actually made money. The men in the ground didn't as such. When slate mining began here, it produced 90% waste, which can be seen strewn all over the hillsides in North Wales. But today, with better machinery, waste is only 10%. There you go. This is your finished product, and this is what these guys were aiming for producing roofing slates so they could make a wage. These places should never be forgotten because of all the hard work and the suffering that went on into places like this to create this to keep us all dry. The finished slate would find its way to the docks in Liverpool before being shipped all over the world. It's important that everybody remembers the people that came here, the conditions they worked under. It must have been traumatic for these young boys of eight years old working down here in the cold and the damp when the life expectancy was 45. These places should be kept open as long as possible. The people can reflect when they come down here what these men went through every day just to put some food on the table. When part of the mine was reopened in 1972 for tourism, visitors were able to follow in the footsteps of the men who shaped this countryside. In more recent years, the unique environment of the slate caverns has become the perfect home for an award-winning cheese in an area of the mine that is not open to the public. We bring the cheese down here when it's at 11 months old and it's stacked on the shelves here for three months and then carried back up to us to creamery to be cut and sold. Sean Jones, a cheese quality manager from South Carnarvon Creameries, understands how important it is to find the right place to store 50 tonnes of product. Bringing the cheese down here with the atmosphere and temperature and the pressure down here gives a unique, intense flavour to it. 500 feet below the surface, the first room they chose to store the cheese was excavated in 1856. Because of the pressure down here, that makes a difference to the way the texture and the flavour of cheese changes. If temperature was too low, then the cheese wouldn't move on, it wouldn't mature, go through the maturing process. So that's the ideal temperature, seven to eight degrees to, for the maturing process to move on. So this is extra mature cheddar now, ready to go back to the creameries. So what I'll be doing now is checking this cheese for the flavor and the profile before we take it back. This stuff's good to go. A ton of cheese is brought up and down on the vertical train each day. This is a hard job where we have to carry the cheese up to the train, ready to go back to the creameries. It seems only fitting the cheese is stored in these old caverns, as it would have been part of the miners' staple diet. Chlechwev Slate Mine has been at the heart of this region of North Wales for centuries. In 2014, the world's first underground trampoline park opened inside the caverns. <laughs> We employed a team of French fishermen who designed the net system and then the zip wheel construction team were brought in to, to install all of the anchors. No machinery, uh, plant, crane, scaffolding was used. Uh, everything was done by hand. As the miners before them, engineers worked by hand, fixing anchors to suspend giant net trampolines, slides and tunnels. The netting is, is basically fishing nets. The bounce actually comes from the tensioning system and the, the belay cables that actually connect the, the main net floor to the, to the walls themselves. It's the only one of its kind in the world, 
combining modern adrenaline sports with history. People come from all over the world to play on this enormous underground net adventure. It's like Victorian times engineering mixed in with modern engineering. I just love the way that we kind of mix the modern technology with the historical side of things. The first time I came down, I was just blown away by the sheer size of the chambers. Just to think that everything was actually mined here by hand and taken out by hand is just, it's just amazing. The way I describe um, the underground caverns here is just truly unique and um, pretty mind-blown, really. Throughout its history, people risked their lives to excavate huge caverns for this precious slate. Now, these intriguing subterranean spaces have been given new life. This was a solid piece of rock at one point, and the men have carved all of this out uh, by hand, blood, sweat, and tears, and it's very humbling for me. They put food on the table. I don't know where I would be today uh, without them doing what they did. And for the community, for the town, for the families, that's what it's all about. Iceland, located just outside the Arctic Circle. Known as the land of fire and ice, 11% of this island is covered by glacier. But beneath the frozen surface lies a fiery, volcanic heart. This is what constructed Iceland. It all came from here. But as you go deeper in, it becomes more and more spectacular. What extraordinary subterranean phenomenon continues to amaze the most experienced of geologists? What do we have here? Wow. It's just like a river system. The difference is, it's in the underworld. Forty kilometers from Iceland's capital, Reykjavik, is one of Iceland's most spectacular underground worlds. Thor Thordeson, a professor in geology, has been studying this area of Iceland for over 50 years. First time I came here is 1965. I came here with my parents. First time I saw this, it was just simple, wow. It was amazing. The lava tunnel known as Ruvaholzhadlia is more than 1,300 meters in length. In Icelandic, the name loosely translates as the cave on the hill with the holes. It's a fantastic place for volcanology, absolutely fantastic. It has everything. The tunnel is actually a lava tube, a void left beneath a hardened layer of volcanic rock when the molten material has drained out underneath. This is one of the largest of 500 lava tubes on the island. One of the things that always, always impressed me here is these beautiful skylights where you can actually see up into the sky. Rolfaholzhadlia was formed in this lava field more than 5,000 years ago. This is the lava that actually constructed the tunnel over. And it just walked across the landscape gradually. As the lava came out of the narrow tunnel, these are all what we call lobes, and they broke out. With each new eruption, surges of lava forced their way underground through the cooling skin of rock one giant blob of lava after another. As the tunnel extended in length, it resembled a series of domes. The lava tubes lengthened step by step, gradually moving forward, but then at some point, the pressure in the lobe exceeds the strength of the crust or the envelope of the lobe, and lava breaks through it. And it breaks through a fairly narrow point, and then it spreads out. And then you repeat this process. Narrow point spreads out. So the chambers represent the lobe. The chute represent the point of breakout. As the active lava traveled, it left behind its story in its hard crust. Earth's history is written into rocks. All we gotta do is have to learn how to read the rocks. While the river of lava continued to flow inside, 
a 10 meter high ceiling formed above. As it cooled, it solidified, creating a network of colossal chambers up to 30 meters wide. So here we have the inner wall of the original inner wall of the lava tunnel. And you can see this black shiny surface. So you had a viscous lava here, which is exposed to heat and it starts to run down. It gets heated up, partly melted, and is running down from the, this little overhang here. And ice here, lava here. Interesting interplay between these two phenomena formed by, both formed by liquids. One which is at zero degrees centigrade, and the other one which is at between 1100 and 1200 degrees centigrade. In all, there are 14 separate chambers in this lava tunnel that have been created by successive eruptions over many millennia. Thor is trying to find the place from where these violent volcanic eruptions begin. As you walk through it, you realize you're walking back in time in terms of lava emplacement, because the ones which were furthest down when we started, that's the last lows that were formed. As we go back this way, we're getting into older and older parts of the lava flow field. And what we're seeing is basically how the lava was building this flow field step by step. These are very important constructive forces. This kind of system is the reason why Iceland is here. This is what constructed Iceland. Records show that the first exploration took place here in 1909. Since then, the whole system became a source of inspiration to growing numbers of visitors, among them Halli Christensen, one of Iceland's most famous mountaineers and now an expert in extreme environments. When I came here for the first time, I had been to several caves, but this one was by far the, the biggest. But I remember the first time coming here, seeing skylights like these, and not just one of them, but like three of them. And that's very, very unique. Over a century, the constant footfall of visitors led to damage. In 2016, the tunnel was closed to the public, while Halley and his team took on the task of installing environmentally friendly infrastructure to preserve the precious caves. It took us a while to figure out what would be the best material to walk on, where we need to build platforms. We could have put wood, a platform made of wood, but it doesn't fit in here, it doesn't feel natural. And although steel doesn't either, a rush to steel gets as close as possible being natural. Also, everything we used, all the bolts, they will not uh, penetrate any chemical into the environment. Any wires used in here are special wires that will not leave anything behind. So the idea was always that we can go here in 30 years, take everything out, and the cave will be exactly like it was before. Creating low impact access for visitors to get deeper into the subterranean world is important. But without the natural light of the outer chambers, experts needed to find a way for people to safely explore. People don't realize how pitch black it, it, it is inside the lava cave because the, the light nor the sound travels anywhere. So just a few meters further in here, if we would turn off the light, we will have 100% complete darkness. And the eyes start to play a trick on you. You start to see white spots on the corner of your eye. It's the eyes trying to find something. If you're in here for, let's say, two months, you develop bl uh, cave blindness and you become blind. You actually become blind. Your eyes will adjust back once you're out in the daylight, but uh, part of your eyesight will get ruined forever. While the lava tunnel is a remarkable creation of nature, its wonders are enhanced by a complex system of cave lights designed to work in harmony with the natural environment. August Gunnlaugsen was given the task of creating this design. So our project was to get the right colors. It was not supposed to be like uh, a Disney project. It was really important uh, from the start that we could, we were just trying to hide everything. Cables, lamps, control system. We installed about uh, 100 lights here. Uh, they're all, of course, waterproof because of the ice and uh, falling ice, rain and so on. 
the lamps can work down to minus 35 and up to plus 30. This is definitely one of the wow factors here. It was just getting through here and just seeing this particular colors in the ceiling. It's so many colors here. It's fantastic. August was given a very specific lighting brief by Halley to bring to life the iron, phosphorus, potassium, and other vibrant minerals deposited by awesome volcanic power. We don't use colors in the lights. We don't need that because we have all the colors in the world in the formations of the lava. I was really surprised how colorful it was. It was just perfect, it's beautiful. The whole thing comes to life and you get this kind of wow factor. You have to use your imagination to realize how much heat, how much power is in here that it, it's creating rock as it, as it flows. It's a flowing rock. <laughs> to fully understand how this underground world was created, caverns offer scientists an opportunity to test their theories about the beginnings of life on Earth. There is no moss or any life at all in here apart from bacteria. We have here in the ceiling uh, this white sparkling thing, which is a bacteria that only grows in, in caves. So this bacteria actually grows because it's co been completely dark in here. It only needs uh, water and, and iron to, to grow. So it's actually being studied, for example, by NASA. They study cave bacteria in Iceland. Away from the tourist trail, geologist Thor is stepping further into the cave than he's ever been before to find the source from which the lava has flowed over thousands of years. This is a huge chamber. This is the hole in the house. It's at least 20 meters wide, and when it was active, it must have been about 20 meters high as well. It's a huge amount of lava that has gone through here. The length of it is on the order of at least 100 meters. We see along here different stages of the lava fl flowing through here. So at some point, it must have filled this chamber. And then as the lava level dropped, and we can see those different marks on the walls. For me, this is, yeah, this is huge. So this is for a narrow bit of the lava tunnel. Thor has reached a place that few people ever get to see. Otherwise, you see, right there. What do we have here? Wow. Nearly 1,500 meters from the entrance, the vent from which erupted the Earth's molten core. This is absolutely spectacular. It's a lava fall. The lava that actually created the lava tunnel came out of here. It's just like a river system. The difference is, it's in the underworld. It's actually in a cave. It's enclosed. We don't see it at the surface. It all came from here. But as you go deeper in, it becomes more and more spectacular. Rufa Holzhadlia is a stunning demonstration of primordial power. Superheated molten rock belching from the Earth's core, forcing through the crust and solidifying to leave behind caves of many colors. A magical sight to be enjoyed into eternity. You are in an underground world. This is a world in its own right.